Good morning, friends. Happy Seed Starting Saturday. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and um, pretty glad to be here with you guys today. Here in southeastern Virginia, it is a beautiful fall day. There's a few leaves falling. It's not cool, but it's not hot. So I'm pretty stoked. It's like perfect cool flower thinking weather. And I'm just bringing up my show notes that Jesse sent me. So today, um, if you happen to have not been here last week, you know that last week we sowed our last tray of sunflowers for the season. And that's a tray that is kind of questionable. I'm not so certain that we'll actually get it, but we, I mean, that's always the thought or the challenge. For me, it is far greater to have those flowers and to think, oh, I'm so glad I planted these instead of saying, oh, well, we lost the sunflowers last night to a frost. You know, that's just minor compared to what the reward is, is when it actually really goes well. Um, so if you are watching this um, over on social media or on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and share it and share it with your friends. Um, and sorry about the beeping, y'all. We're working on that. It's a tech problem and we'll just have to ignore it. Um, and like and share it. And that's what really helps YouTube and Facebook to show our broadcasts to more people. Um, and so we can reach more people and help more people and bring more people into our fold. And we really appreciate for all of y'all that have already um, done that. And if you're seeing folks post that sunflower emoji, those are people that are actually identifying themselves as the Gardener's Workshop family. And they join the family by becoming one of our students of any of our online courses. And we just really love when people do that. And we literally have students all over the world, y'all. It is really so cool. Um, and so that just really helps me a whole lot. So I'm just looking at Jesse's um, notes before I dive into my talking points that I kind of made up myself this morning. I made up. I was working on another project and I thought, you know what? I think I want to talk about that today. Um, remember that you can go in and watch the replay of the show yesterday. I am in fact today, I am going to do some swift blocking. I'm going to make soul blockers with the block, um, the commercial size blocker. And I've got some babies to show you. And um, we'll do that after I get through my talking points. But that is also what I did yesterday on the live shopping show. Um, normally the Swift blockers, which are the commercial size tool to make um, soil blocks, normally they're not in the phone app. Um, because their shipping is beyond what we're able to charge over there. We can't customize that. And so part of a special is when we do put them in the app, you only pay $9.95 shipping for products, as many products of different mixes that you want that's in the phone app. Um, so that's kind of our special. And we did that yesterday. So the Swift blockers are available inside the app until 8 a.m. Sunday morning. And this is September 30th of 2023, if you're watching the replay. Um, and we also had a cool, well, my favorite tools. You know, it's this, my pouch and shears and the sod knife and the hand hoe in a special bundle for a special deep discount. You'll find that. So visit, if you haven't already visited our phone app, just get it from your phone's app store, search Gardener's Workshop, and you can check it out. Um, and that's a lot of fun stuff. And we always, you know, if you want to think about joining us each week, I always give something away. Yesterday, I gave away a $25 store credit to one lucky live viewer. So I'd love for you to be there. And also, um, I'll share with you guys. So the book, you know, we are at the very end of this very long process, y'all. Two years, just about. Um, the book is going to the printer's or to that next stage, like here's the finished product, print it and forever hold your peace. From the publisher to the printer, October 9th, I've been told, I'm not sure if they're still holding to that. But anyway, this last week, um, I got to see the back cover, the back cover and the front cover together because they're a jacket kind of. Oh my gosh, y'all, they are so pretty. They're so pretty and bright. And I just... The book is just getting richer and richer every time. I mean, as we're tweaking and 
getting down to the bottom line. And I just cannot wait for you guys to have it in your hands. Um, and if you want to get on the wait list so that um, so when you purchase your book from us, there'll be additional resources that come with your book. And we will be having some special stuff come out before the book comes out in February of 2024. So getting on the wait list just means you might get one or two emails from us um, before the book comes out. It's saying, hey, do you want to do this or would you like this resource or something like that? Um, so get on the wait list and you can do that in the app or on our big website. Either one of those, um, just join it. And then lastly, I don't know if any of y'all are on Joe Lample's email list. You know, Joe is the Joe of um, Grow a Greener World, a PBS gardening show that's gotten Emmy Awards. That's in, it went for 13 seasons. Joe has become a really dear friend of mine. And he and I have done some podcasts and um, his podcast, which is really, really big, y'all, because he has so many people. Um, I think he hit seven or eight million downloads last year. Well, guess what? My chat with him about cool flowers was one of his top podcasts last year. And you got to go listen to it. It led him. He's a vegetable guy. It led him to plant flowers and write many flowers in his vegetable garden. And he talks about how it lit his vegetable garden up for the better like he has never experienced. Anyway, if you can check that out, you'll find it on whatever you listen to um, your apps, your podcasts on the Joe Gardner show. Um, and Joe's just a great host. Um, and anyway, I'm just so grateful he charged that out again. Um, and so my vegetables love flowers chat with him, which was our first, um, was in his top 10 of all time. Um, and I think Cool Flowers is going to smoke past that. But anyway, so check that out. I got the email. I'm on his email list. And when I got that this morning, I thought, oh, my gosh, y'all about cried. It was just so nice. And um, it's just Cool Flowers is going to be 10 years old next year. And the fact that it is more popular and more people understanding it today than then is very unusual for a book. And it's pretty awesome. But that brings me back to um, our podcast. We have two. We have the Field and Garden podcast, um, which you will find that both of them any on any app that you listen to your podcast. Um, and that's pretty much me talking about flower farming and business. And, um, you know, sometimes Dave and Jenny and other people are on there with me. Um, and then our other podcast is Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Um, Lane is the seed manager at the Gardener's Workshop. And that podcast was started out of questions that she would get through customer service. And we started talking about those things. So it's a really great podcast and you can check it out here on YouTube or on your app. Um, so one of the things that we added, you know, this is our wrap up week for seed starting Saturday. And cause I'm not starting seeds anymore, right? I mean, Bobo will still be starting the occasional cool flower, but the lion's share is actually done. Um, and so you do have an option to actually get questions answered. You know, we have two really great ways to do that. One is on Instagram, ask a flower farmer each week. Um, sometimes we have a guest host, but they are flower farmers too. They could answer your question, but that's where you can reach me on Wednesdays, Eastern time, 1230 um, to one at the Gardener's Workshop handle. Um, and now we've added to the live show that I do on Friday at the end of the show, I answer a few questions just like I do here. So that's a great way to actually get your question answered. If you're not one of my students where you can tag me in our private community where I would answer your question, those are two ways that you can actually um, reach out to me. So, you know, this morning as I'm doing what I'm getting ready to talk to you all about, I thought I should just really um, share this. And so what was happening for me is um, I just thought to myself, I was started writing notes and it's like profound notions from flower farming. And what it was really happening for me is so as we are moving, because literally um, we will have very limited um, harvest from here on out. And as our harvesting has just shrunk drastically, right, from the season coming to an end, when I hang up my harvesting shears right here, when I put those up, 
I pick up some other tasks that are even more important to my business than those flowers are. Um, funny enough, Jenny Love and I did a live together a couple weeks ago on, I think it was, we did two, one here on YouTube and one on Instagram. I don't know which one it was, but Jenny is like me. We're, we kind of call ourselves the flower hustlers. Both of us are about becoming a profitable business. A, Jenny is the breadwinner. I mean, that has been her whole business for the last 15 years. You know, she doesn't have a second income like I do. Um, but, but put that aside, it's like, this is a lot of work. I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. This is a lot of work. We need to make this profitable so that more people can be involved anyway. So um, I made the comment to Jenny talking about, we were talking about that her course is really about business. The Flower Farmer School is more about business. It's not about growing and even arranging flowers. And I said, you know, so I said that and I said, because y'all know that the flowers are only like a third of what this business is all about. And Jenny piped up immediately and said, and see, she said, Lisa, I think that they're less than that. And I'm just giving you the picture that in a flower farming business, everybody thinks the flowers are the lion's share. And that is in fact, nothing is further from the truth. Um, and so these things that I have trained myself to pick up when the harvesting is the biggest, most time consuming, labor intensive um, part of our business, because it's the beginning of a of a fallout. Right. I mean, you cut the flowers, you have to sell the flowers, you have to fix the flowers, you have to deliver the flower. You know what I mean? A lot of other jobs are piggybacked on that. So when there's no flowers, all of that goes away. Um, I used to I used to think back years and years ago, especially when Steve, my husband, Steve, who owns a plumbing company and they, he, his part of the business that he kind of runs is the big jobs, you know, the outdoor sewer lines, water lines, big emergencies, big equipment. So he works outside. I can remember as I hung up my shears, I used to think I picked up the laundry tasks because we both wore so much clothing in the wintertime, you know, long johns and coats, and we were constantly getting dirty. Um, that's not quite the case for us anymore, as he doesn't do as much of that. And I don't either. Um, so I have actually trained myself as I'm easing into it right now to look back and really evaluate the past year. Um, and not just so much what worked and what didn't work. It's like, and what do I really want to do next year? Um, because one of the things that I think is the most profound for me is you don't know what you don't know. And you don't know what your, what your opportunities are until you get to the next step sometimes. You know, you would have never dreamed of doing this until you've done all of this. Um, and so going back and reviewing my practices and um, doing it now, and this is what really got me started. So I, I mentioned this yesterday and I'll say it again, and I'm sure my sister's getting in the car to come slap me um, because I'm not supposed to speak of things that aren't ready yet. But I am working on another course. Um, and it's a cool flower based course. And I was thinking about this morning. It's like cool flowers because I've been growing cool flowers for 25 years. Right. I mean, that's what I launched my flower farming career on. And while the facts of growing cool flowers have really not changed, right? But the practices and the things that I have found that just really aren't necessary or needed are so different today after doing it for 25 years. And you know what I compare it to? And I don't have children, but I understand that with your first kid, you're super overprotective and overdue, right? As you, you know, fussing and carrying on. And then by the time you have your third or fourth kid, you know, they're, they're like lucky to even know your name. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I don't mean that, but I mean, you just let them go. Um, and that's kind of what I'm, how I'm thinking. There's just so many pieces to being successful to a business. Um, I'm applying it to cool flowers right now in the project I'm working on, but this is in business too. It's like, you can't look at your business today and look back and glean the opportunities 
today, those opportunities were not available to you last year. The, the, the opportunity might have been there, but you didn't have the experience or the knowledge to actually do it. So each time, each season, as you're rolling up, you can look and say, okay, I mean, I'm thinking of, you know who else I'm thinking of right now is um, Laura Beth, who's a good friend. She is Butterbee Farm. And she and her husband just recently picked up and moved their farm um, to a family farm where her parents are actually going to live there with them. And Laura Beth is really moving to that model as so many flower farmers that ha are getting years of experience is they're focusing on perhaps sp heavy spring crops, no real summer crops, heavy fall crops, and winter growing. Some are doing all of those, some are picking something. But you'd have never dreamed that you would do that until you really got experience. And so this is what happens for me, is I will, as um, we ramp down, you know, we still have flowers to cut, but, you know, we have cool flowers to get ready. That's a whole nother discussion. All of those steps, right? the fall chores, getting everything ready. And so what's going to start happening for me as part of my business day, and if you too are a flower farmer, you've got to understand learning and reviewing is not something you do on weekends and at nights after dinner. It becomes part of your business day. So what I do is just immediately take those times that I would have been harvesting flowers preparing flowers, selling flowers, or whatever your process that follows the harvest, those gets plugged in with something else. And what do I do? So I am rereading. I read the same few books, and there is actually some um, a video here on YouTube that tells you what my five go-to books are. Um, and I'm sure Jesse might probably put the link on here. Um, and I've read a bunch of different books, but I skim through most of them. It's those that have the tried and true experiences that I know now have worked that I go, I go back to them all the time. Y'all I reread Lynn Bozinski's the flower farmer pretty often. And every time I read it, how many years have I, that's the book that started me. How many times have I read that book? I can't even guess how many times. And every time I go back to it, I learn something I never knew before because I'm in a different place. I'm looking for different stuff. So what I am doing is I am rereading the same books that I've been recommending and talking about all this time. And I'm not saying there's not good new books. I'm just saying a book to become a part of this elite group has to have some real meat and potatoes. Um, and other books for pleasure reading or for a little bit of information, perhaps, or bits and pieces, or I might sit down and look through one. But for the boots and the trenches books for me, um, and Jesse did just post it. So if you are watching the replay of this to see the comments during the live show, you have to be sure you have to select the live viewing comments. I think they're there. You just have to kind of hunt for them a little bit. Um, anyway, so books, I am digging back into books. I mean, I have so many little tabs marked on my books, right? And what is the other thing I'm doing? Y'all re-watching courses I've taken. Um, we just purchased a really big business course um, last week that we are diving into, which is new. But guess what? I'm still going back to a couple of three core business related courses um, that I refer to all the time. And the one that I took, um, I know that y'all have heard me mention the online course, the course that taught me how to build online courses, which it's kind of like I attribute to me learning how to flower farm before we had the internet. That course is so basic on the rock foundation. It makes it simple. Um, I go back and refer to that all the time. And I cannot tell you how every time I go, I come away with, holy cow, why wasn't I doing that? Or that is an option now. Let's try that. Y'all do not underestimate the things that are already at your fingertips that have been those great resources um, 
that you're just gleaning so much information from. Whatever helped you in the past, I promise you will help you again because you're going to be reading it with new eyes. I am studying all of that again. Um, and, you know, all this wisdom and firsthand experience that I've gained is literally reshaping my farm, reshaping our um, e-commerce business, um, our online course business is constantly moving and shaping. Um, and I've already said, I'm just looking at my notes that I wrote. I again, want to say, you might think if you're a flower farmer, that the flowers are the biggest part of your business. And I beg to differ from that. Um, if you don't have all this other backup behind you, it doesn't matter what you grow. If you're not selling them, selling them profitably, selling them consistently. Um, and now is the time that um, you can really glean that. Um, I'm just reading what I wrote down here. Um, you know, I wrote books, comma, courses, review, review, review. Um, I will tell you that I'll be um, our students we send out an email um, coming not quite yet. It's a little early um, to say the winner is the time that you can listen to it like a podcast. You any downtime, you should be listening to every one of the sessions in your courses, because I'm telling you, everything you need to know is there. You just haven't absorbed it yet. Um, and so many times we have the information at our um fingertips, but we do not know it. Um, and we don't, we don't know that we already have it. You know what I mean? It is so easy to keep looking across the fence and thinking, oh, there's, there's another, um, maybe I should, you know, try that. While you, you really do already have the basics sometimes. And it's truly getting up and doing the basic stuff every single time. Um, so that's kind of what's happening for me as I'm throttling back the harvest season here on the farm. Um, I pick up and what, it, what I consider to be the most important part, um, as well as flower farming stuff. You know, the ASCFG has conferences. Of course, we have courses. If you want to start or expand um, your flower farming business or piggyback, farmer florist, if you're a designer or somebody that, you know, I'll tell you, um, the story that um, Ellen Frost tells is that when she started out 17 years ago, she thought she wanted to be a flower farmer. She had experience being with flower farmers and local product. And she went to work on a local flower farm and quickly figured out that that's not her sauce. That's not her jam. She wanted to be involved with local flowers you know, she loved that whole farming, producing, um, supporting community, but she didn't want to be a farmer. That's how she became a designer that only uses local flowers. So there's no end to the opportunities. And you can find all those over at thegardenersworkshop.com. Um, so I want to just show you guys quickly. Um, so what I'm going to do is do some swift blocking for you. And I have to kind of change the setup a little bit. This is I'm MacGyver in it. We talked about that yesterday. Y'all can't believe the people that I work with from Jesse, who co-hosts this, who is the producer of all of our live shows. She's in Kansas. And the girls here with boots on the ground, you just can't believe them yesterday. Figuring out stuff. So while I'm doing talking about this, I'm going to change See that ladder. We couldn't live without that 10 foot ladder. So let me and I have to move this table. It's going to make noise, y'all, because I can't really pick it up. Maybe not. All right. So not the prettiest background back there, but y'all, this is the way it is. So let's see. I didn't even test this before I did it. Oh, you can see me. Okay. So Swift blockers um, are the commercial line of soil blockers, which I didn't bring soil blockers over here. Um, and they're different sizes, and the big key, why I call it the commercial, let me lift this up a little bit, it's kind of chopping my head off, isn't it? That beeping noise about to make me crazy, y'all. All right, so the commercial line 
not only makes a little bit different size, but it makes more of them. And that's the streamline. So I'm just going to show you some examples and then I'm going to get rid of these. First off, this is the, um, this is my hand tool. This is the three quarter inch. This is the one I've done for all these years. I should bring those closer so y'all can see them. Um, so this is a hundred. This is some yarrow that just popped. Um, this is a hundred of the three quarter inch blocks that are made with the hand tool, right? So a hundred fit on this tray and works super well for tiny seeds. Um, and I still, I use all the blockers y'all. And as I often say, if you're just starting out, um, I would start out with the hand tools. The, the, the commercial tools obviously cost more um, and that's not the place to start necessarily. These are snapdragons that are again, growing in that three quarter inch block um, and do beautifully. These are about 10 days away from going to the garden. This is a hundred snapdragons. These are our yellow special custom dragon mix. Um, so they do really well with that. And so this is the last one again, and depending if you're a home gardener with the small blocker, you can do, this is three clusters of 20. This is Reed Becky, y'all. Um, and this is the small blocker. Let's see if you can see the roots. The roots are pretty ridiculous under there and you just pull them apart. So that is the way I've done it for all these years. And then Dan made the soil, the swift blocker. And so this is a tray that has both sizes of the blocks. This is the swift blocker mini 75. And this is the mini 27. This makes an inch and a half. Let's see if we can't break this apart without me destroying it. Look at this. See those roots? This is Sorinthi, by the way, a cool flower. Um, and I wanted to grow them in both size blocks to see how they would do. So this one has 75 blocks of the, the it's about 0.9 of an inch, right? So it's a little bit smaller than an inch and there's 75 of them. And this is an inch and a half. For me, as a flower farmer, I would choose the one based on the volume of plants that I need. If I was farming, I would go with the 75, but they also do beautifully in the 27 if you don't need so many, right? Um, so let me show you how we make these. And friends, it is so quick. It really is kind of crazy. All right. So I use the same mix that I use when I'm soil blocking and it's moist. You can learn all about this on our website. You will actually, you can see more of this on our app yesterday. If you want to purchase these with the special shipping offer, you have to go to the app and buy them by 8 a.m. Sunday morning, but it's always on our big website. The shipping is just the regular shipping cost, right? So let me show you the blockers. Y'all can tell I'm, I'm here by myself, not with my crew, because they have thought of all of this. So this is, um, I'm going to show you the blocker. Each blocker comes in two pieces. This is the 75, this is the base, and this is the top. And you'll see it in action here in just a moment. So that's the 75. And then this is the 27. And you fill this baby up and in one push, you have all of the blocks. This is the scraper cedar, which I'll tell you what, how that works here in just a moment. I really want to move y'all a little closer. If everything comes come tumbling down, y'all, sorry. <laughs> All right. So I didn't add any water to this this morning. This is the same tray that I used yesterday. So I'm just adding a little bit more moisture since we had it wet yesterday. I definitely use gloves to do this because you're putting your hands in the dirt and you just don't want to get dirt all over kingdom come, right? And I still use a potato masher. And I'll fix this better so y'all can see a little bit better. I can see you can't really see in here. So I need to move your bucket closer. Because y'all want to see it, not me, right? All right. So this moisture in the soil is pretty much just like for the hand tool. You can get away with this being a little less 
moist. So, you know, we always use trays with no drainage holes. You just place the base of the Swift blocker that you're filling here. And you, I just pick up a mound and you're smashing it in. You're try, I'm trying to be fairly neat because you don't want soil to fall on the sides because that interferes with maintaining your blocks later. You know, you don't want dirt down there because it's kind of hard to get out. You know, when I'm doing this as a demo live, I'm always trying to do it quicker. I have gotten a lot faster at it, but in my experience, it's better to take a minute to do it without having making such a mess that you then have to clean up. And you can see I'm just smashing, especially um, along the edges and the ends. You know, the great thing about soil blocking, it's kind of like painting a wall. If you screw it up, you just dump it back in and make it again, right? And so sometimes, like now, I put a little bit more than I know is going to work out, and it's just easier to scrape the mass off with my hands. And then I'll use the scraper. And we I use two scrapers. I have a wet straight, a wet scraper and a dry one. Because if I was going to sow seeds in these right now after I scrape, then you it needs to be dry, right? So I literally am just scraping the excess. Doesn't have to be perfect. And so you have a couple options. Like if I was sowing snapdragons or celosia or any of those tiny seeds that are surface sown, you can actually do it before you push the blocks out. Super time saver. Literally, this is a little concave along here. This just sits right on top. You match the holes up to the blocks. And so this scraper seeder only seeds the 75. This doesn't work for the 27. Um, you dump your seeds right here and you literally just take your finger and drop it into the hole. Um, then let's assume that we've sewn this whole thing with snapdragons. And then you take your um, top tray. Let me just turn this to the side and just set it on top. And I usually try to just make sure it's lined up properly. Pull up and look up. Oh, I kind of messed that up. This is the joy of live, y'all. I pulled it too fast. I was too proud of myself. Anyway, if that happens to you, you can just literally dump it back in, right? But look at this. 75 blocks in seconds, literally, literally. So let's make some 27s. Now the 27, just like I often mention when we're using the um, two inch hand tool, is it uses a lot more soil because it has a lot more soil in the block. So I only use the larger size blocks when it is actually really only warranted by the seed or the volume. Um, so this makes 27 of the one and a half inch blocks. And I'm gonna do the very same thing. So you can just dump them back into the tray and do them again. This takes more soil. And as I mentioned earlier, I use the same blocking mix that I use for the hand tools. Um, it's living soil. It is not sterile. It is um, the recipe is always on our website. It's basically peat moss compost with nutrient. And the nutrient is green sand and rock phosphate. That is not my recipe. It is Elliot Coleman's. And we just grow incredibly healthy, vigorous transplants using it with very basic and simple ingredients. You know, y'all, you might, I'm always trying to not have a lot of stuff, not have a lot of different tools. That's part of our profitability lot, right? Especially when you start hiring staff. The fewer things that you have to have and supply and keep on hand all make a difference. All right, let's see if I do a better job with this one. There's the mother load of those. Now let's scrape. All right, let me give this one a try. 
And so I wasn't as careful here. I want to show you. See that dirt right there on the edge of the tray? I'm not sure if you can make it out right along here. I mean, preventing that because that gets in the it's in the channel where you're watering, but you can't really get your fingers in there. So it just makes another step. So I just make sure it's secure and pull up. And there you go, friends. 27 one and a half inch blocks. Pretty daggone amazing, actually. Um, so the Swift blockers um, fit our green trays, as you can see. There's actually a kit available. Um, What's well, available on our website, but again, it's just less shipping for the weekend over on the app for $9.95. Um, you can get the kit, which is five trays the mini 75, the scraper, and the nutrient to mix with your compost and peat moss. And I hate to even say the price because I'm not certain. You have to go over there and look. I think it's too, I'm not sure. You have to go over there and look. It's an investment. That's why I say if you're just getting started soul blocking, you know, you definitely need to start out with the hand tools. Um, I still use them. We use them all the time. Let me see if I can just stand up here. All right, friends. Um, so that just really, sorry, y'all. Now I have to come down. I'm going to sit back down. This is kind of awkward. I mean, I was using a bucket to hold y'all up, right? And I'm trying not to cream my seedlings, which I'm actually doing here. But aren't they beautiful? I love baby plants, y'all. Um, again, that's another really big part of flower farming is being an efficient and consistent seed starter, right? All right. I see Jesse has some questions for me. Oh, and she, she put the kits on here. Thank you, Jesse. Holly, what is the name of the program you just mentioned that tells you the basics for setting up an online business? She does not, does not do that anymore. So that was, um, 2018. Um, in fact, she um, works privately for a big foodie person now, someone we would probably all know. She manages their social media. Anyway, so that's not available anymore. Um, but yeah, so but it's very different than so many. There's others out there, obviously, now. Um, but she was just it was just really great basic course. Morning, Lisa. Can you talk about eucalyptus and how you cut on it for the best cuts and for the plant center cut or just laterals? Great. Yeah. Um, so I was just looking. I used my eucalyptus up yesterday. So eucalyptus um, is an annual, right? And I happen to live, I'm in, I'm farming in zone 7B slash 8A. It literally depends on how the wind blows in the wintertime. Um, but it's not supposed to overwinter in either one of those zones. But with a little TLC, we get it to winter over. And the real reason to do that is the amount of harvest and the quality is so superior. After you do it once, and I think we actually said this in the book, you know, I have success doing wintering over just enough to make me try every year because, I mean, I have parvula gum. That's the little dark green one. Um, it's taller than I am out there in the garden and it is full of lateral branches, all that are, you know, this long. Um, so when I first year, I literally only cut it in the month of like the end of October. I'll give it the long we get. We start the seed in January because it's slow growing, just like Lysianthus, to get it in the ground immediately after the last frost of spring and really cuddle it to get it growing. And we don't cut it until October to have the most, just to really make it. We, and when you get, when you're cutting a lot of volume of flowers, it really is not profitable for you to go say, oh, well, I will um, go over there and cut just a little bit. <laughs> it's better to just wait when you can just go over there and really get a good cover, a good crop of um, stems. So for me, um, if I knew that it was going to winter over, I would pinch for sure. We typically don't pinch our eucalyptus because we're just don't, I mean, we get one year's growth and that just slows it down, right? We might actually do a test with that this year. 
pinch half or something. Um, so I pinch, so if it's this tall, the first cut I cut is like halfway down and that leaves a gob of laterals on the side um, that will then continue to grow. Um, and on that one I cut, there's one great central, but there's a bunch of laterals there. So I don't know if that helps you or not, but I don't center cut because there is no regrowth in the same season, right? It's not like a regular. So I cut that center as deep as I can to have a good cut for it, no extra to cut off, and then take all the laterals off and we use them. Um, and that helps to just preserve all the other laterals. And each week we take a plant and just cut it, um, cut the laterals off. And then going into winter, so I have plants that parvula gum, this will be a really great um, experiment year. So parvula gum wintered over better than any other one that I grew. I grew um, polyanthemus, silver drop, which that seed has not been available for like two years. And I don't know if it'll ever become, do y'all know why the eucalyptus seed is not available? I never knew this. So I'll tell y'all eucalyptus seed is actually forged in Australia. It is not a cultivated crop. It is out. I mean, they have eucalyptus trees everywhere, right? And that's where they collect the seeds from. And with all the forest fires in Australia, that's why there's basically no eucalyptus seed. And so for us at the Gardener's Workshop, if you're not on a wait list on one of those eucalyptists or on all of them, you'll never get seed from us anyway, because when it comes in, those people that are on the wait list get a little ding notification saying, hey, it's in stock, grab it now. And it's gone before anybody else even knows it's there. Um, so that's just a side story. So parvula gum, better than silver dollar and better than polyanthemus, um, went a hundred percent survived winter. And you have to remember that last year was that polar blast in December, where we were down to 11 and nine degrees in December, they were deeply mulched with leaves, a 12 inch plant cut back to double lightweight row cover um, and secured, protected from the wind and full blast and sun all winter. Um, so they wintered over beautifully. The big question mark is, will it winter over for a third year? Now that it's, you would think because it's more mature, it would survive better, but that's not in fact how it happens. A lot of times they're just, because they're really kind of annuals um, in their behavior, unless they just really live like they live in Australia where they grow into giant trees. So that's the big question mark. So that's what I would say. Center cut what you need and then cut all the laterals and go from there. Um, would it be a good idea to use one tray for loading the soil without concerns for a mess and transferring the soil blocker to a clean tray before unloading the blocks? What a great question. So I actually, um, nobody else seems to be able to do it, but I figured out how to actually load the swift blockers just like I do the hand tools, meaning that you have a tray full of the soil, um, wet soil. You push the blocker bottom down into it to fill it up. Then you have to lift the tray, not the tray, the blocker with the moist soil in it and lay it over onto a tray. That 100% avoids the mess. However, there's a really fine line of how wet the soil can be so it doesn't just fall out because especially like for the 27 it's really a challenge um, i've mastered it and i actually showed it when we first started using it and so many people are like oh my gosh i can't do it that way so i just went back to loading it from the top um, so you can do that and that's the point of doing it that way um, is you Fill, push it down into the soil like you do the hand tools and you can still load it from the top, pack it, you know, and even scrape it. You don't have to scrape it. You can scrape it in either place. Um, and the problem is getting it off the bottom of the tray, it suctions and getting it over to the tray. But that is a really great point. And if you have luck with that, let us know. All right. I'm in zone 6A. Do I cover plants in winter that I fall plant to stock lace flower larkspur received from last year? Okay, Patty. Um, so 
Uh, see, we don't plant stock. I'm in, I'm warmer than you and I don't plant stock in the fall. Um, and I'm not sure what you're calling lace flower. That's a common name. I'm not sure if you're saying that's didiscus. Um, and so here is the rule that I follow. I only fall plant, unless I'm trialing something, I only fall plant those plants that are known to be winter hardy in my zone. That means for you that you would only plant plants in the fall that are zone, that are um, winter hardy to zone six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Um, so you would have to look up. I'm sorry, that's backwards. In six, five, four, north of you. Um so you'll have to look that up. I think Larkspur will actually, I think that is zone six. Stock, I'm pretty sure is not. And Lace Flower, I'm not sure what that is. Um, and a lot of things can reseed. We just never rely on that and don't really pay attention um, to that. But I know Larkspur definitely is a reseeder. I don't know. Stock, of course, I don't think is. Um, but I hope that helps you, Patty. So we only row cover for wind protection, environment protection, not really for cold. Um, but, you know, we have a polar blast. Even those that survive my winter, a cover just helps to protect and um, keep the foliage in better shape, right? So hope that helps. Tom, when you pull out the old flowers from your beds, do you leave the roots in the soil for compost or take them out? We do them a lot of different ways because we have, so Tom, um, we have a no-till area of our garden and we have a conventional. When I say conventional, meaning I use a tractor with tillers, it makes bed, have a bed maker. Then we have no-till areas of our garden where it's actually, we should call it low-till. I just use a walk-behind tiller on the tops of the beds to mix stuff up. We don't go deep. You know, we're not doing the pathways and all that stuff. Um, and I've done it both ways. I know that there is great benefit in the roots there's a lot of life in the roots of plants. So this time of the year, when you're going into winter and you've got warm season tender annuals in a bed, I can definitely see the benefit of cutting the plant off and you have to do it at ground level or you'll have a bunch of stubble sticking up that does not break down like you seem to think they, like we think that, that, that it does, especially in the winter. The winter, nothing's going on on the surface. Even under a silage tarp, it's just too cold outside, right? It just sits there and waits. So if you cut warm season tender annuals off at ground level, and then I would think put a couple inches of compost on top of that and tarp it for the winter. We're actually getting ready to do that on some beds here. Um, so that means come spring, you can just take that silage tarp off and you should have weed free, beautiful beds waiting for you. Um, but then in other parts of our garden, depending on something like if cool flowers need to be planted right away, I don't, I, you know, it just depends on what's growing there and what the soil is like. We typically in a no-till bed or a low-till, we would pull the plant out, roots and all, and put it on our compost heap. So it gets incorporated back into the garden at some point in time, but just not right then. And then I do the same thing. We put down fertilizer and compost and either smooth it out or mix it in with a tiller or with a rake. Um, but in our big garden, we bush hog the plants, till the stubble in, and it all comes out, you know, works out for the better. So I hope that helps you, Tom. Casey, we've had the flu. Oh my gosh, we've been so sick around here too. I have a family member that's had COVID for four weeks. I mean, sick COVID. She's not in the hospital, but it's miserable. Anyway, totally feel your pain. You're not way behind. That is, that my book is going to preach that to you, y'all. You're never behind. You just pick up from where you are um, and get busy, right? So I'm way behind starting my cool flowers. Am I too late to start in zone 7B, 8A? No. So first off, your zone only tells you what you can fall plant. Doesn't tell you when to plant it, okay? So you're the same zone as me. And um, secondly, the second window to all that everybody can plant cool flowers is in very early spring. So there's definitely benefits to fall, but I'm just saying if this was December or January and you said this, 
I would say, well, your next window's coming up, get busy, right? So we are still, st I mean, you know, we got stuff just sprouting. I still have stuff on heat. Bobo will be starting because we're waiting on seeds for some things. Um, here's the ticket. When you're planting seeds in the garden, when you're direct sowing, which we only do that for a few things, um, just because it's more work to direct seed, y'all. You know, put aside, most people think it's the opposite, but it's not. You really do have to get your direct seeded stuff in kind of on time. And when do I plant? My first expected frost is mid-November. Don't know when yours is. That's what tells you when. We tend to aim to be direct seeding in the next two weeks, um, six to eight weeks. It's a little bit closer to the four to six weeks, but it's been really hot here and seeds will not germinate in the heat. Um, so you don't have much wiggle room on direct sowing. Transplants, on the other hand, because you're growing them up inside and you walk out to the garden with a tray of plants that you can plug in and hoop and cover to give them a little TLC if it's a little later in the season. The big thing you need to jump on is getting your beds prepared and getting your direct seeding done in the next couple of weeks, I would say, and get your transplants going and then you'll, you'll plant them when it's time. Um, you know, getting the beds prepared is the big deal. What's what we're chomping at the bit around here. I did not follow my own instructions. We not that, not really, but I mean, it's just been crazy here. Um, we're just so wet. So we're our, there, the big garden is ready and waiting to, for beds to be made with the, with the tractor, but it's just too wet. So we have to wait. Um, so that's the answer to that question, Casey. So guys want to say, you know, this is our last seed start on Saturday, but you can find me on Wednesdays on Ask a Flower Farmer. You can find me on Fridays now in the live show. And I do a Q&A at the end of the show. You can post your questions during the show. Um, and, you know, I am knee deep in revamping as everybody should, you know, I mean, you need to look at, you know, if you had, you know, this is one good point for flower farmers. If you had one particular customer, if you're selling to commercial people or a particular way you were selling flowers, that was just really, really difficult, challenging, whether it was a difficult customer personality or the method is just too, I mean, for instance, um, I have a cousin that um, they don't sell flowers. They sell something else. They were desperate in the beginning. So they started delivering their product. Even though you paid for delivery, it still does not cover the time and cost that they have to invest to be able to do that. And so, you know, a time comes that you can stop doing things that you did last year. You're the boss, you're the business owner, and all you have to, you know, present is there's, we just can't continue to do that. You know, we don't have the staffing or it's just not, we're just not able to provide that anymore. Um, and so often it's like me just telling you that we're not doing seed starting Saturdays. We're not harping on that, right? We're harping on that you'll find me on Wednesdays and Fridays, um, you know, and you, so you, you can, you can stop doing things that didn't work for you. Don't feel like you're stuck. I do want to say that is another caution to like, don't be too desperate in the beginning and do things that, you know, you can't sustain for very long because then you have to undo them. Right. Um, so friends, I, I can't wait to see you on the show this Friday inside the app. And you know, you can watch the replays anytime when you have the app and the specials that we offer each week are good until Sunday morning at 8 a.m. like the Swift Blockers this week and that special tool deal. That's the deal of the day. And there's a lot of demo videos over there. Um, and I can't wait to see it. And I'm doing Ask a Flower Farmer this week. So friends, hope to see you there. And thanks, Jesse, for being here. And she's put a lot of, a lot of, um, links in the live comments. So if you're watching the replay, go find those. Um, I just appreciate each and every one of you guys. All right, friends, till we meet again. Ciao.